Well, then let's talk about the multicultural aspect of okay. it, too, because, again, I mean, <laughs> you sure know how to open cans of worms, and uh, that's a big one, too. Yeah. So it, the bottom line is I'm just being true to my own soul. That's all I can do is just be authentically who I am evermore. And I grew up with diversity. I grew up being um, the token Jew in a certain school environment, surrounded by African-American young people who I had total and complete resonance with and hung with. Um, with a father who was raised in Mexico and spoke many languages, um, playing on the border of Mexico and Texas as a child, um, living in close proximity with people of many different religions. It's just, and I grew up in a city. I actually grew up around a lot of diversity. And I also somewhat had religious upbringing but it meant very little to me. What meant something to me was some of, the, some of the religious ceremonies I saw going on around me. They attracted me. And I would get myself around them whenever I could. <laughs> um, I had a woman who was part of my family who was very Catholic, and I would go pray with her. You know, I never told anybody I was doing this, but off I would go. And it, it it satisfied a deep hunger in my being. And, um, you know, and I was a little deadhead, you know, I didn't care how I got to this experience of something bigger than myself. So, um, I was never okay with the inequities I saw going on around me. I, I was never okay with seeing somebody put, hurt another person or disregard them. And it, it, you know, it hurt my personhood in a very deep way from a very early age. And I would like do things about it, you know, and I was always kind of an advocate for the underdog. And, you know, I would take my 25 cents allowance and I would make sure that as I was following behind my parents, I was giving it to somebody when, especially when we spent our winters on the border. So um, with that said, this is going to sound pretty funny, but I'm just going to tell you this story. My grandmother would always, I just put this together yesterday. Well, there's two things. My grandmother on my mother's side crocheted me this beautiful little picture that was above my bed my entire childhood. And it was of the old woman in the shoe who had so many children she did not know what to do. And it was, and I would look at it you know, for a decade and a half above my bed. And I'm sure it had some kind of subliminal messaging for me. Plus she brought me dolls from around the world. And I didn't really want toys. I just had my dolls. And I just would study their costumes and how they looked and everything about them. And I just, I learned about the world through those dolls. And then I had the good fortune of once going to, uh, I guess Disneyland, and I went through small world, small world. And as far as I can tell, that was my first ecstatic experience. I was out of my mind to see people to the same music, all dancing from many parts around the world. And it took me till like my 40s to put all this together, but to realize that imprinted me so deeply. And, um, you know, it's like, my soul has just been revealing itself to me organically over time. It's not like I had this idea. It's just been what's natural. So there I was at 21 years old in a village of Kodakarai in South India doing this work, having this epiphany about the children of the world are calling. And then I was living in New Mexico as a single mom saying, who's going to help me raise this child? Feeling totally alone. And I saw all these kids doing drugs in a back alley and I just sort of this voice said to me you're going to raise the children I'm going to help you raise the children you know and these were like lightning bolts messages coming to me and before I knew it someone was contacting me from this same part of South India saying we've got two young people we'd love to send to your camp and it turns out they're from the same village and now they're in their 20s and you know spirit conspired to get all these people and the way this has organically unfolded is so much bigger than any cool ideas of mine 
truly. And then the reality of it all is here, which is, okay, so there's issues of race, there's issues of class, there's issues of, of cultural and cultural appropriation, there's issues of uh, diverse religions, you know? And well, it's Friday night and certain people want to have a Sabbath, but we dance on Saturdays and other people want to have a Sabbath on Sundays. And we've just hung in there for these conversations. And I'm grateful to have these conversations and sit in the tension of it and discover answers that don't in any way um, whitewash the needs of the individual streams, cultures, races that are coming in the room and that cause us all to grow and really consider what it means to be on the planet together in a respectful way. I also know that there's a deep hunger with the people who somehow end up in our rooms although they might be feisty and they might challenge, and, and that happens a lot. There is a um, longing to find that thread that actually also unites us and unifies us because um, us and them is gonna, is gonna cause us to have big problems. And I think we all now know that the environment is leveling the playing field anyway, you know? So our community and our work is a living laboratory for really the evolution of consciousness. And um, my time in Oroville at 21 made a big imprint on me about um, creating environments where these uh, conversations and these complex dynamics that are all over the planet can be explored. And um, just recently I sat with a group of young people who really have formed what we're calling the diversity committee, the uh, diversity team to support an even more conscious unfolding of how we respect the many different uh, ways, diverse ways of praying, the diverse ways of, of uh, well, prayer is a big one, but even the diverse music, the diverse food, so that Everybody has a sense of, one, sitting at the table and having a say in how things unfold moving forward into the future, but also feel that there's um, equitable comfort and familiarity. I mean, I'm not create, we're not creating rites of passage that's all about comfort, but you know, just to have one kind of food versus another kind of food is actually, um, you know, it promotes exclusivity, and we're, we're looking at it at every level. And um, I have a, so many of these young people who, like I said, came as teenagers are now adults and care very much and love this work and are really here to help grow it so that it can meet the needs of many, many diverse communities. And, and honestly, it is rolling out in many places around the world in ways I can't even know of. I mean, I know one young woman who <laughs> sent us a video of herself doing a little version of all this with a gun as she was doing military duty on the border in Israel. You know, I mean, that's an example. I know that some of our leaders are doing work in the villages in South India, helping really uh, revitalize their indigenous arts, but infusing their approach to that um, with tools, with practices that they learned here. So there's so many ways this is, um, it, honoring diversity and simultaneously um, there's some hallmarks to the practices and to the ethics and to the ways that we work as a community here. Well, you, you sort of t answered it, but I, I still want to ask this question. So what do you say to somebody who says, well, you know, an African-American okay. person yeah. needs an, an African-centric initiation and, uh, you know, a, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I've had those conversations many times that um, people who come from traditional cultures and communities where they have rites of passage that really um, infuse a young person with the traditional ways of their people, I am 100% supportive and encouraging and advocating for those rites of passage experiences to happen. And to me, this is complementary and not exclusive and quite honestly, this without that 
it has some limitations. And um, I really encourage people to understand where their people come from and what are the ways of their own traditions so that they can be incorporating that into how they live their lives and what they stand up for in this life. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Um, you know, surfing the creative, you, you sort of touched on this earlier, but I want to name it. I mean, it actually does have more of a feminine energy to me. And, and, and I'll tell you why. I mean, well, first of all, the dancing itself, and, and this is this is not a universal, this is a, a very relative time-based judgment, but the culture connotes, our dominant culture connotes dancing with more feminine energy these days. I'm not saying that's how it should be, etc. and I love dancing, but that's one thing. A second is that you absolutely have men on staff, but you're a woman leader, and, and the leader team is predominantly women, uh, or at least they outnumber the men. And then also a third thing is that the, the, the initiates themselves, the ratio of girls to boys is roughly two to one, uh, or at least it was in this last week. So, um, so I, I'm just curious how you, would, how you would address that. I'm so glad you asked the question about feminine leadership and the masculine in this work, Frederick. Thank you. So this work began like so many rites of passage communities began in these contemporary times out of uh, parents' need for something for their children that wasn't happening. And I really joined together with other single moms, you know, it's just who showed up, who felt incredible gaps in their children's development. And it was ridiculous for years. It was like single moms and we just support each other and we would be creative with our kids. And my first summer camp, which was sm called Small World Dancers, it was for little children. I've worked throughout the life cycle very, very deeply. And then I worked with pregnant women. And then all of a sudden I felt confident to like work with the pregnant women and their husbands and postpartum the whole family. And it's just been an organic process of my own transformation and the work's transformation um, that has made it possible for the men to want to come in the room, to feel confident that they'll have a voice in the room, and to be ready to come into the room. It's just been a process. And we are really at a place now where I'm so excited about this next generation because quite honestly, in terms of powerful leadership, not necessarily uh, somatic therapists, but in terms of powerful leadership, there's equally as many men, if not even more so than, than young women. So I feel like it's just an organic process and um, we are moving towards a collaborative leadership process that feels very um, much embracing the spectrum of gender and gender identity and all of that. Um, and yes, it started off as a single mom with kids and kids and kids who had no parents and kids who had didn't know their dads or, or a dad who wanted to come help and yay. And, you know, we just have been building it by who shows up. And um, there were years, I mean years, that I was wailing for more masculine collaboration and support. And, um, and I still weep at times about the gaps that so many young people have not with uh, because of absent parents parents who passed away or parents who can't show up and um i'm so grateful for the work that happens in our community that supports more and more men feeling ready and confident to come in here and work with us because we really need you guys we really need you guys and it's sweeter for everybody and it's more effective and i i just also want to say that um, in the dance world i think we have more men than many many of other conscious dance scenes 
And I have some really potent colleagues that are really helping to build the men's work in this community. And it's slowly happening. And it's been a deficit, Frederick. It's been a deficit. Do you have to bend over backwards to try to recruit more men to be no. initiates or to come through the work? Or? No, not at all. No. But the ratio, uh, I assume, has never been much different. Uh, uh, than there have been a now. few years it's felt closer to 50%. There really have been a few years it's been like that. Um, so it just depends. You know, it all started with one young man at 14 years old who came in. You know, we joke about it, totally. He had the bravery, the call, and he showed up. And then there was one older man who showed up. And, you know, that's how it started. And, you know, and that's just how it started. And then a mighty river comes behind that. You know, I, I have a related comment, and it's not even a question, but I, I, I'm going to say the comment, and you can respond as you see fit. I mean, you know, I got to say... You know, on that first day, that first Sunday, you know, at the Avalon Ballroom, and I'm seeing all of these uh, people, but I'm, I'm noticing the women in the room, and I'm noticing all of these beautiful young women dancing, by my standards, half naked. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, oh my God. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what are these young men thinking, you know, who are gonna be going on this journey with these young women? And it, and it cracked me up because on day three, you said in the morning something to the effect of, and you might have started to feel attraction toward the opposite <laughs> gender. And I, I think it started, <laughs> and I, I'm laughing, you know. And I, and I, so that's anyway, that's just my comment. Well, that's so great. I'm glad you're bringing that up. I have to say, you have not met. Our community has a team of elder men that are fierce protectors of the dance space. And they carried this community through the whole generation of leaders you just met and all their escapades on the dance floor and off the dance floor with each other. And they were not in the room necessarily with this particular rites of passage, but there's a team of noble uh, kings who have, have called their brothers out on, out on behavior, who have helped women who have a history of opening faster than is maybe good for them and get on the dance floor and self-exploit. They've really been helpful in building some, again, social norms that are healthy, that allow people to heal, because I'm really inviting them to open wide, but not because I want them to have an experience of perpetration again, you know, and it's not just towards the women. So there are some older elders who are, you know, got their eye on that and have had to work it inside of themselves first and have actually. And this next generation has that in their, in their makeup now because one, they've seen the impacts of their own exploits and adventures and two, because they really get the work and they want to protect their younger sisters and brothers. So I felt, I mean, some of the wildest ones, the ones who were absolutely out of control in their teen years and in their young adult lives, were the ones who were like, we got to we got to leave the dance floor because there's two people missing it and we're sure they're sleeping together. And, you know, they were all over it. I'm like, I can't believe it's you who's really concerned about this. So we have some real health here and some some awareness of all this. And and I'm not into shaming anybody. Of course, we're attracted to each other. And learning how to work with that energy is part of part of this path actually and i have been tested throughout the course of my life as has pretty much every one of us yeah no i, I appreciate that and especially the last part of that answer about learning how to work with those energies is really essential and naming that you know because i i certainly appreciate you know the container holding aspect of it i mean i uh, you know, I, I certainly uh, am there a hundred percent with you and I, you know, I, I, I felt like not only in, in with myself, but with other men, you know, it's like I want to be on top of protecting the sacredness of this space and it's like, oh my God, what a fucking distraction. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I want to be initiated, but I mean, I'm walking around like a, a dog, you know, with his <laughs> tongue hanging out of his mouth. You know what I mean? And I, I, to be honest, I'm looking forward to talking with Miguel about that a little yeah. bit. You know, what was his experience of that? Because my guess is 
that was quite a different cultural experience for him too vis-a-vis -vis young women uh you don't see women walk around east oakland like that very often well frederick we've had some really cultural complexities around that you know where young amer uh you know young white boys just strutting all their stuff and and young women from south india who actually have never had a viewing of their own bodies and we've spent time in that room really wrestling with that and talking about that and how can we create a baseline that allows everybody to be in the room in a way that respects their culture and you know we definitely had to we didn't go deeply into the conversation this particular ride but we invited a certain uh, group of the men to actually wear shirts because it was culturally inappropriate for some other people and we're not about that um, the other thing is the dance itself is the medicine to help us work and channel and open all that energy and ground it and um, personally it's like another thing that catalyzes more um, expansion in the body and if you're aroused that can become fully sexual or can become connected as sacred creative god-given energy that we want to make a conscious choice about how we channel onto the planet and so you know bring it on yeah <laughs> yeah well yeah and i i mean I, it's entirely possible that you said those very words more and uh, often than i actually heard them or maybe i was out of the room or something but i think that's a point that really needs to be said and said and said again. thank you yeah Feedback received. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Frederick. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's shift gears a little bit and just talk about your organizational structure and, you know, <laughs> the challenges that are there and, you know, in particular funding. I yeah, mean, yeah. Well, you know, this started off as like a summer camp in my backyard, literally. And then it grew to weekly dance classes and then it grew to community events and then it grew to seasonal events we've done seasonal events for years and then it grew to smaller rites of passage events for birth and death in particular or with smaller groups of individuals who were coming of age or moving into young adulthood and um, there's been a very organic growth here and um, again it was like it started off in my basement and we've just had to grow up actually organizationally we've had to figure out legalities with the state of Colorado and then we're working with kids from all over the planet and the r laws when I go teach in New Zealand are totally different and you know all of that and we've had to shift everybody's expectation about what was once just a community offering now has become more cumbersome than all of that and yet how many parents either can afford to or want to pay for their child to have a rite of passage experience with some strange group of people in in this town you know and of course it it has saved many families thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of psychotherapy if that's how that family uh, rolls um, it's kept people brought people back to to this work has allowed people to really move out of addictive behaviors and substance use and abuse and many young people have uh, changed their relationship with medication or even worked with some of the dynamics around incarceration and gotten on with their lives so it has been it, it would be a good investment for many families but most families don't see that and part of our job is going to be to be communicating about that, to tell that story so that rites of passage in general and this work in particular um, connected with the whole field has, has a different kind of credibility. However, um, I also believe that it's every young person's right who sincerely wants this. And we recently had a situation where a young person was, didn't fully enlist themselves and they weren't up for the ride and they didn't really go on this journey in the same way so I'm really about young people making this choice for themselves what we've learned is um, they're happy to invest in it once they have a sense of what it is and that could be ten dollars just some 
investment or their time and lots and lots of young people and their parents or somebody in their community invests time. But the truth is this work is underfunded around the planet, not just right here in Boulder, Colorado. And I lived with a lot of confusion and, and even anger. You know, it's like, come on people, we are raising up your kids and no one's, no one's showing up to help back us. Like, could somebody pick them up at the airport at least? And, and I came to realize that part of why these kids are hurting is because no one's picking them up at the airport. <laughs> And that what we're going to do is figure out how to give these young people what it, their birthright, actually, which is a experience of being potently and consistently supported, along with being um, invited and at times, uh, n what's the word? Um, invited and what's this word? I'm looking for? Not. Uh, oh well, inviting young people. <laughs> to um, and, and encourage and nudge, that's the word I was looking for, inviting young people, nudging young people to keep moving forward with their lives. So um, that we were, gonna, we were gonna provide that and we were gonna do whatever we could to make that possible for young people, that there could be a place where sanity, where safety, where their dignity, where sanity and safety could happen for them so that their true dignity could be ignited and remembered actually a lot of just remembering. So one of the ways that it occurred to me to work with this community and, and gather resources from this community, this local one, was to have these Sunday morning dances where we don't charge a lot of money, but actually those dances um, fund many years a third of our rites of passage process, which is a sweet way for individuals to consistently, you know, tithe and put money into the basket. And that, that, that's wonderful because then everybody feels a little bit invested in this next group of, of young people coming through Surfing the Creative. I have also, you know, gone and sat with parents and said, what are we going to do here? How can we work together to make this experience possible for your child? And had some hard conversations with adults um, who, who So I've sat with adults and, and parents and had some of these hard conversations with people who seem to me um, are able to contribute to their child's experience, even if they've been estranged from their children. And I've had those conversations on the front end with parents and I've had them on the back end of our rites of passage uh, journeys with the parents and the children, how to move forward. And, so I've, I've sat in those hot seats. And then we've done really conventional fundraising that hasn't proved to be terribly successful because we're not just a, a program focused on a um, specific population in a six week easily understood process. Uh, this whole thing is sort of outside the box and a little unwieldy and people were like, you know, we can't really help with that. That's not something we can put in our funding package for this year. But there are foundations that have supported us absolutely and do consistently. There are individuals who have come to understand what we do and just it's what they do every year. They contribute a certain amount of money. And, um, you know, some years we have more money than other years. And we're looking at a three year plan and working with the whole next generation of leaders, looking at, we have this amount of money, what do we want to do? So it's no longer really about me, and it's no longer really about even the administrative team or board of directors. It's actually around this community that has now taken full responsibility for the expression of this beautiful work, but now I'm inviting them to join me in taking full responsibility for the sustenance of this beautiful work. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to move from a whole different kind of organizational, from what was really one woman's vision and the founder and all that stuff to a more collaborative uh, responsibility and leadership and directorship of this, of this golden bridge. And we, we've given ourselves three years to go through that transition. And um, 
to actually have a paid executive director and relieve you of some of those duties too? Or Say that again? To have a paid executive director and relieve you of some of those duties too? Is that I'm not sure it? exactly how it's all going to go. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure what's going to be decided. But I have other things that are calling me, as you know, and it's not walking away from this, but it's more about training people and it's also about doing this work and really seeing it ignited in other places around the world that also need these simple practices for healing and awakening and yeah. bridging. Yeah, Let, let's talk about um, both how you define a rite of passage, but also whether you share the notion that I do that it's kind of a unifying field theory for youth development, that, that in a sense, it, it, it helps us connect the dots of all of the various youth dysfunctions into one potential solution. Well, I'm going to answer that first and then I'll define a rite of passage. I, I feel that rites of passage for youth development um, has the capacity to unify the field of the divergent needs um, with young people coming of age and moving into adulthood. And certainly it's aligned with the positive youth development movement, absolutely. And it is a missing piece in so much of the programming and thinking behind uh, youth development. With that said, there's ways to cheapen something called rites of passage that could end up working against the unifying of the field. And calling every after-school arts program a rites of passage concerns me because it won't do what we're talking about in terms of layering in um, values and um, giving young people vehicles for self-regulation and for identity uh, exploration. So, I feel uh, discerning about how we bring it into a more modern and mainstream consciousness about youth development. And rites of passage without the elements that I speak to very specifically, without repair work, without education, and without mentoring, so that just have the initiatory experience, to me is actually almost irresponsible when coming and working with young people. And I feel that the field of rites of passage, by nature coming together in community and by nature putting, uh, cre creating environments where young people can interact with the natural environment, all that is very repair. It helps young people repair the ways in which they are disconnected from themselves, from their true north, from humanity, their own and, and others. Certainly those things help. But I also think that there is some learning that as a field of rites of passage we have to do um, that will help us strengthen our work in terms of really learning how to repair a nervous system and unwind trauma in the body and um, move from a state of activation into integration. So that feels important to me in our conversation about rites of passage. In terms of the educational piece, which feels, which for us is a second component of our rites of passage uh, journeys, that's critical. And I know, for example, in many different traditional uh, ways of initiating young people, education's intimately woven into everything. Young people are taught the ways of their ancestors, are taught you know, the ceremonies, are taught how to tend to themselves and their environments, all sorts of things. That feels critical to me. And um, practical uh, tools need, practical skills need to be taught in rites of passage. Uh, processes. It feels really important. You know, how do I navigate once I go out there? I had the sweetest moment with one young man. We were done with surfing the creative and he was getting ready to go home and he and I went upstairs. He'd never put on a washing machine 
and he learned about stripping his bed and doing the whole thing. And it was, to me, one of my favorite moments of the summer. It's like, he just felt so empowered. He couldn't wait to go home and tell his mom about, I know how to do my own laundry now. And, you know, for a lot of these kids, that's not a big deal. But for this young man, that's like a ticket to being a responsible member of his family. And so I'm really interested in, and it can't happen while on the mountain. Some of it can happen. We certainly taught a lot around values, a lot around self-care, a lot about right relationship with each other. But some of these practical things come over time, come with the mentoring, coming with the ongoing education. And then, of course, the mentoring. Um, we can mentor young people who haven't been initiated. We can mentor young people who are walking around the world fragmented. And there's plenty of good mentoring in those situations. But to have given a young person experience where they can unwind the false persona and begin to access their true noble nature and their, their, their brilliance and their calling and mentor from that place, that's extraordinary. And that's where rites of passage and youth development just got to get together and, and uh, learn each other's ways. You know, it's interesting, um, Angelis Arian gave me probably the simplest definition of uh, a, a rite of passage, uh, and it's along the lines of what you just said. It's basically, she said, skill acquisition and demonstration of mastery of that skill. Beautiful. You know, and it, to my way of thinking, that might be overly simplistic, but nonetheless, I thought it very interesting and useful. Well, do you want me to talk for a minute about rites of passage? Well... Because I haven't spoken something that feels really important around all that. All right, then yeah. go ahead. To me, a rite of passage is any experience that deconstructs us and causes us to have to meet something bigger than ourselves and find within ourselves resources to um, integrate the experience and return to life in a new way. And birth, the experience of being born and the experience of birthing. Death, the experience of holding a space and returning from the loss of a beloved, and death itself, of course, and so many other uh, natural developmental transitions can be powerful rites of passage, as can life crises. Um, you know, the sudden death of somebody we love, the flood that just came through our community, the, um, the genocide that I just sat with all these kids who survived, they have had mad life crises and as a result of it they have been initiated through rites of passage and it wasn't a program designed by their community at all. And in fact I found them to be some of the most integrated, resilient young adults I've met anywhere on the planet and we can talk about that. So there's just the natural rites of passage experience that is developmentally in you know, part of life, there are the life crises. And then there's the natural cycles of the day, sunrise and sunset, and the four seasons if you're in a climate where there's the turning from one season to the next. And those natural cycles to me also have moments where there is a bit of a right if one is awake to the transition happening. So I, for me, I just, I'm fascinated with all of life cycles actually. Yeah, well, that's and that's actually just FYI, a point that the film is going to make very clear that, in fact, there's six or seven, depending on how you name them, logical rites of passage in a given normal human lifespan. Yeah. And that the focus of our film is just simply one of them, from adolescence to young adulthood. Beautiful. But, but arguably, they're all of equal significance. It's just that, for whatever reason, I find this one most pressing and and needful of, of further uh, uh, discussion. Um, Certainly a lot of need here. Yeah. You know, so much of, of um, adolescent behavior has been criminalized and has been drugged, you know? We just give them drugs or we throw them in jail or, you know, and that's pretty much our s social solutions to, to adolescent behavior. You know, talk about how um, community responses could be different. Great question. How can um, communities respond differently to young people as they navigate the complex waters of adolescence? Well, my first strong um, feeling about that is 
that the adults or the people who have spent enough years on the planet to be called adults actually have some work to do with themselves to befriend their own unfinished adolescent business so that they can sit comfortably in the wild, creative, unpredictable energy that is adolescence and that is betwixt and between. So I feel that um, creating environments where um, the adults can really deconstruct their own childhoods, their own biographies, so that they really can consider whether they're living their own true destinies, that feels really important. And for the losses that they have faced to be really grieved and the things that cause them to be angry really understood more deeply for its pure nature. And, and are they living in alignment with that soul that was stirring and rising up into action in their adolescence? Or have they self-medicated? Or have they shut down and sold out? Um, where have we betrayed our own inner adolescence? Or where, how can we get the supports so that we can become ever more comfortable with our own vast creative intelligence inside us. That feels to me like the first bit, bit of business, which means we may have to really investigate our lifestyles and make some choices that ironically will help us pass on to the world and to our children's children um, the kind of health environmentally, economically, educationally that we actually say we want to. So that's the first bit of business. And to me, that's not like a one weekend workshop. That's a life path. And I feel if we could understand this energy called adolescence, the chaotic uh, disorganization and reorganization that's happening in that soul birthing and come, become safe ground for it to dance with and upon, um, our young people would have more options for what they do with all that energy. And if we could together create more spaces where young people can come and really learn the things that they are longing to learn, um, rather than just these ancient textbooks and sitting at a desk and passing all these tests and going to college and succeeding in a good way or getting a job and, and showing up and being paid minimum wage, if we could actually just even once a week give every young person an opportunity <sighs> to remember something about this creative intelligence awakening in them, to access it, to express it, to experience it, there would be um, less despair and less destruction. And that means we have to rethink what we do on Saturday nights and how we live our lives so that we actually create room in our day for these young people. and and. What I've learned, and I've sacrificed some things as in my adult life to be able to be present with the young people, but what I learned is that the joy and the uh, even ecstasy that I have with my, with my peers, with my colleagues, when we come together and create safe spaces that are inspiring for young people, that is far better than, than any number of other things I could do on a weekend night that are more traditional or common or, and such. So, um, the, yeah, so that's a bit of my answer to that. Yeah, no, that's great. You, <coughs> actually, I thought of another question and... I don't uh, remember the question. <laughs> what, what are, I'm curious, what are the benchmarks that you use to measure a person's uh, passage, you know, through this soul birthing, you know, through the eight days of surfing the creative. How do you know this person's got it? Um, that's something I'm really working on being able to try and uh, share with the next generation of leaders. We just had a young woman come through our surfing the Can, creative. Have you name the subject too? That's yeah, okay, great. So the question is, um, how do we know when somebody has actually completed their rites of passage and are now standing in their ad adult authentic, autonomous self. And I actually have mapped a journey from um, through the process that I, I do use to study the development of, a, of my students and, and now some of them colleagues into adulthood. 
But there are these moments that I just want to describe one and then I can share that map or not. We'll talk about that. I ha we just had a young woman come through Surfing the Creative and she's come through before. And she keeps showing up and she keeps doing her work and this time she had a very different experience. She didn't go through it in the traditional way. She actually spent a lot of time outside the room working with some hard material inside herself. And when she finally came back in and joined the group, she was brighter than I'd ever seen her. And she was, a, she was um, very enthusiastic about what happened and continued to show up. And just yesterday, in one of our uh, in days where we were doing some work around incorporation and we were talking about diversity issues, all of a sudden this young woman just like stood up and like a brilliant world change advocate for, for understanding around race, she spoke up about what it was like for her people in the inner city. And she blew the entire room away. And I just looked at her and I looked at everybody. I said, she just stepped onto the leadership team because she knew who she was. She stood in it with so much love. She was inclusive of the diverse ways and kind towards the ignorance but ruthlessly telling her truth in a way that caused everybody to forever remember her message. And um, she was, with, the f with um, full potency on her own path, there, nothing in the world could stop this young woman from doing what she came here to do in this life now. And she wasn't asking anybody for permission, and she, um, transformed our room just by her very presence. So I watch for those moments and they can show up in a piece of art. They can show up in a project that happens down the road. That can show up in a hard conversation that a young person finally has with their parents post camp. That can show up in how they wrestle with me. And I, there have been many, many people who've come through and they just naturally start doing their work and it's easy and it's obvious and they just feel empowered and um, you know I think of one young woman who works in the in the film and video and she just came she gathered her tools and her resources she went and did her own thing she developed some other parts of her uh, practice as a leader and she's back and in such a dignified way she just sits in her authority and does her work in the community there are others who push really hard against me, who have to, and, and some of the other adults, who have to really question everything that I'm about, try to take me down, uh, you know, who have mother issues or father issues, and is there really room for them, and, you know, am I for real, and we have to go through all that stuff, and I just hang in with them, and it sometimes brings me it's really painful. It's really intense. And I, once I bring somebody into this community, unless they are violent, which has actually, thank goodness, never happened, um, you know, I'm here for the long haul. I may have to set some big boundaries. So um, last summer I did a teaching where I marked for my most seasoned students what I perceive as the developmental stages um, through this body of work to where they can be standing next to me as colleagues. And the first is for many, and they don't all come in at the beginning, but really we're carrying them on their, our back. And whatever it takes to get them in the room, whatever it takes to get them through this process, we're there with them. You know, there's just a lot of unconditional mothering going on and t helping them find their relationship with their body and that there might be some safety on this planet and, you know, all is well, you can do no wrong, just keep showing up and we got gotcha. you. And from there we move into a place where people can start to stand on their own legs and explore and ask, they're really starting to ask their own questions and having some sense of this is where I come from and I'm, I'm different than you and I need this. And you know, we're walking side by side but there's still a pretty strong leaning on me or the whole leadership team or their particular person that they've chosen. And I, I really see that as like more of the fathering. So we move from a mothering to a fathering where we're just uh, still really in, in, in a strong repair around parenting dynamics and all kinds of things can happen there. And then there is this adolescent developmental process that people go with, through with the authority in this work. And um, 
It could be also how they are relating to their own parents. They're people who've come through this work for years, but really haven't left home yet. And they're already in their mid-20s. <laughs> and last summer I had a situation where I set up a constellation where there was a man and a woman. They were pretty much their peers. And I asked this young woman to stand, where are you in relationship to your parents? She put herself smack in the middle of them. And I said, and where do you want to go? And um, she took about a half a step out and I let it sit. And then we did a whole bunch of work the next day. Oh, and there was another young man who started there too. And I said, and where do you want to go? And he stepped way the heck out there. Ironically, he's not even here this summer. He's on his path. So I um, came back to that the very next day. And I said to this young woman, after we'd done a certain amount of work, here's the constellation, where are you now? And she stepped out quite a bit further. Since that time, this young woman has left her home country. She's engaged to be married. She's changed her career. She's on her path now. But she really um, had to be called out on the fact that she was still hiding at home. And it wasn't serving her anymore. It was actually toxic. And I'm not into pulling people out of their relationships with their parents. She's actually closer than ever with her parents. I respect and value parents wholeheartedly. And as you know, I talk about this thing called the STAR team, which is where I encourage young people especially as they're starting on the journey of early adolescence, to think about who are the adults who you want to ask formally to come around you and help you navigate through these complex waters ahead so that you have yourself, you have ideally your mother, father at your base, and so many don't, so that's complicated. But who are the other adults that you're going to ask to be there late at night when you need to make a phone call, when you can't call your parents but you need to get home safely, or something's happened and you need to talk about it but you're not ready to talk about it with your parents? Who are are those people so that every young person as they're awakening to the incredible star that they are actually have a team to help them navigate and it's not just mom and dad so in this developmental model then we move to this next place which I really call mentoring where so many people they've left home they've started to they're really individuating and they're starting to cultivate their medicine and their their gifts for the world and there's I love working with people at this stage these are the people who've done the rites of passage they really have a desire to bring something beautiful to the planet but they need a team of people who are professionally sound and have experience and can help them create a beautiful project, be it a peace village or a whatever it is. And so that's one phase. And then there's a place where people have to actually say thank you to their mentors and they're doing their thing. It doesn't mean they're not constantly learning or constantly reaching out, but their relationship with this work, they're standing in their true voice, they're running their ship, they're making their own choices, and what I think about it actually is not that important to their um, sense of success and their success in the world or what I can contribute or any of it. It's really theirs and that's so exciting because then we really can be colleagues and psh, that's where I am with so many of the people who started off really truly with me carrying them on their back or my team carrying them together. Great. Well, that's a great uh, answer. This Great six answers. <laughs> Is there anything that we haven't addressed that you want to address? And I do want to be cognizant that it is three. So I'm okay. okay. I'm okay. This is my free time. I, I, I'll need to check. I have an hour and a half today to myself. Um, I would like to say, um, again, with a enormous humility, that I do not know what happens in many cultures and their rites of passage initiatory processes. And that in no way do I ever feel that the work we're doing replaces that. I feel that for certain souls, it can complement what happens in those environments. And that I really encourage people to go home and find the people who are of their lineage who can teach them their traditional ways and that I strongly um, am an advocate for the protection of indigenous and traditional ways on this planet and that um, although we are not place-based we are place-based and that um, 
this work grew out of a response to a call that basically keeps being sounded by young people coming towards our community and asking for something. And as long as that is happening, we will continue to grow and change and, and respond to that call. And if ever this dance is done, we will give great thanks for what has occurred and let it go. Nice, yeah. Well, great. I mean, I, I heard you loud and clear earlier, but that was an even nicer way of saying, making the same point, I think. Yeah, it feels so, important. Yeah. And yeah, to my way of thinking, it's very simple. It's both and. It's just both and, you know. It's, um, and yeah. then there's, in an ideal world, you know, every person would be offered a kind of a cultural initiation. And you have to make room for those who push back against that and don't want, a, you know, don't want that. You know, they might not, uh, they may return to it in 10, 15, 20 years. But, you know, you've got to give them opportunities that, uh, accept all comers, like your work does. Can I say you another know? line that feels like I didn't weave it in, that just keeps saying, to speaking sure. to itself? Yeah. When you asked me what would my life have been like had I had mentors, and I really didn't know how to answer that, if I, if I had had an initiatory experience in my own adolescence. Um, this work grows out of my commitment that no young person would ever have to experience being as lost as I actually was and consistently putting myself at risk in the ways that I did, that's what has propelled me forward. Not so much what would it have been, but just may it never be again. Oh, that's beautifully said. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. And that, that's a lot of my motivation too, actually. It's quite similar. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a question or a, a thought about something we might not have addressed? Oh my gosh, I don't. I feel like it's in a really thorough, um, when I did, then they got answered for. Okay. You know, so I, I don't feel like I'm. Can I say one more thing? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the last one. I'm never cutting. <laughs> okay. Here's the real deal. I, am, I love so much the people I get to work with. We have soul dates with each other and we're keeping them. So many of the young people that I work with, my leaders now, were born the year I graduated from high school, were 21 when we ran our first Surfing the Creative, and are now, you know, just standing as mighty oaks next to me in creating the container for this work. And so, for me, it's really back to where we started. It's about love, and it's about getting to hang out and do really cool, interesting, complex work that must be done with people that feel like family. And, and, and they are. <laughs>